problems in the conclusions of the Warren Commission's report, the CBS news people made their own inquiry into the assassination. They conducted a shooting test to try to duplicate the feat attributed to Lee Harvey Oswald. One of their volunteer marksmen, the one described as the weapons engineer who had the best score, was a man named Howard Donahue. In addition to being a marksman and a weapons engineer, Donahue was also a ballistics expert and a firearms examiner and a gunsmith and owned a gun shop. He testified in court as an expert consultant. It was Donahue's involvement in the CBS reenactment that sparked his interest in the JFK assassination. It took Donahue three tries in the CBS inquiry to beat Oswald's purported time. Bear in mind, Oswald only had one chance to accomplish what he purportedly did. Donahue knew guns. He knew bullet behavior. He knew trajectory analysis, and he brought that expertise to his study of the Kennedy assassination. He studied the Warren Commission publications, including a number of witness testimonies and the small black-and-white Zapruder film images published by the Commission, as well as books and articles critical of the Warren Commission's conclusions. And he eventually came up with a very interesting theory about what happened a theory involving our guy, George Hickey. One thing that Donahue noticed was that a number of witnesses at street level had smelled gun smoke in Dealey Plaza, gun smoke that could not possibly have come from the Texas School Book Depository, given the direction of the wind and the height of the shooter's window. This diagram shows approximate locations of some of the Dealey Plaza witnesses who smelled gun smoke, as well as the direction of the wind. The wind direction is confirmed by weather history for that day, as well as the Warren Commission testimony of motorcycle officer B.J. Martin. Among the gun smoke witnesses was the mayor's wife, Mrs. Earl Cabell, riding in the car behind Johnson's follow up car. She was, quote, acutely aware of the odor of gunpowder. Photographer Tom Dillard, riding further back in the motorcade, smelled it. Virginia Ratchley Baker, standing in front of the Texas School Book Depository, smelled the gun smoke. Dallas Police Patrolman Earl Brown smelled it. Officer Brown wasn't even in Dealey Plaza. He was on top of, not the triple underpass, but the next underpass, the Stemmons Freeway underpass. He smelled gun smoke shortly after the motorcade had passed beneath him as it rushed to Parkland Hospital. At least one newspaper reported that the area reeked with the smell of gunpowder. There are a couple of other important nose witnesses of whom Donahue was not even aware. Senator Ralph Yarborough rode in the car immediately behind Hickey's car with Lyndon Johnson. He smelled the gun smoke all the way to Parkland Hospital. And then there's Parkland Hospital triage nurse Bertha Lozano, who smelled the smoke inside the hospital when the motorcade entourage burst through the emergency room doors. Given the wind direction and the sixth floor elevation, Dealey Plaza witnesses at street level would not have smelled the smoke from the shooter's window of the Texas School Book Depository, and any gun smoke from Oswald's weapon would certainly not have clung to the motorcade all the way to the hospital. The smell of gun smoke was a very important clue. Australian detective Colin McLaren, who studied Donahue's work, called the odor of gun smoke a, quote, plume of residue, end quote, that lingered in the vicinity of the gun that had fired. The title of his book and accompanying documentary is a reference to that plume of residue. Donahue also noted that the size of the entrance wound in the skull, as measured by the autopsy doctors, was 6.0 millimeters, which is not consistent with the ammunition Oswald was supposed to have used. 
assassination in the book Mortal Error. He says Oswald did set out to kill the president with a Carcano rifle like this, but also says the fatal bullet could not have come from this kind of gun. The entrance wound in Jack Kennedy's skull was smaller than the diameter of a 6.5 millimeter Carcano, which ruled that out. And then it suddenly occurred to me, could this have been an accident? The diameters of bullet entrance wounds in the skull are always larger than the diameters of the bullets that cause them. The 6.5 millimeter Carcano bullet, here on the left, was too large around to create the 6.0 millimeter entrance wound in Kennedy's skull. However, such an entrance wound would be consistent with ammunition that had a smaller diameter than 6 millimeters such as a bullet that was 5.56 millimeters in diameter, also known as a 223 round, shown here on the right. Another clue was what at least one witness said about where he thought a shot or shots came from. Austin Miller, on top of the triple underpass, said that the shots sounded as if they came from the president's car. In addition to noting these clues, Howard Donahue also conducted a trajectory analysis based on the Warren Commission's wound locations on Kennedy's head, Kennedy's head position in the Zapruder film just before the explosive headshot, and the angle of the street to trace the bullet's path backwards. However, when he put everything together at their proper angles, Donahue determined from that trajectory that the fatal headshot came from the trunk of the car. That, of course, made no sense. Then Donahue met the chief medical examiner for the state of Maryland, forensic pathologist Dr. Russell S. Fisher. Dr. Fisher was a top man in his field, a pioneer in forensic pathology. He had served on the Ramsey Clark panel which was the medical panel that was convened to review the autopsy findings in order to provide information for the Clay Shaw trial, and which negated the need for the autopsy doctors themselves to testify under oath. But Dr. Fisher's complete honesty has been brought into question with regards to the suspicious death of high-ranking CIA officer John Paisley, for which Dr. Fisher conducted the autopsy and which Dr. Fisher ruled was a suicide. The Paisley autopsy was suspicious for a number of reasons. The body that was identified as Paisley's, based on fingerprints and dental records, was cremated before the family could see it. The body was substantially shorter and lighter than Paisley's was known to be. The position of the supposedly self-inflicted bullet wound on the left side of the head was unlikely for a right-handed man such as Paisley. And why would a suicide victim weigh himself down with a weighted dive belt? So we wonder if Fisher may have been willing to work with certain government agencies, perhaps for purposes that may have been to protect someone who might have been endangered, or for some other unknown reason, about which we can only speculate. Dr. Fisher told Howard Donahue that, no, 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 the bullet entrance to Kennedy's head was not near the external occipital protuberance, as the autopsy doctors reported. It was some four or five inches higher up at the cowlick. This cowlick entry made better sense to Donahue, as he didn't really think there was an assassin with X-ray vision hiding in the trunk of the car with a tiny hole to shoot through. So Donahue used this new cowlick entry and connected it to the front of the head blowout exit and traced the line backwards. Where that line traced led him to a very interesting conclusion. The fatal headshot did not have a right-to-left trajectory, as would be the case for a shot from the Texas School Book Depository. In fact, it had a somewhat left-to-right trajectory at a much more shallow angle, too shallow for a shot coming from the Texas School Book Depository's sixth-floor window. On the right side. Now, when Kennedy was shot, the entry and exit wounds were described only as coming from above and behind. 
they didn't show you the main thing, what direction did they follow, and this is what it was. They went from left to right, not right to left. Oswald's bullet traveled right to left, but the bullet hit Kennedy's head and went from left to right, eliminating the possibility that Oswald fired this shot. Given Kennedy's head position in the Zapruder film just before the explosive headshot, the entire headshot trajectory, with its slightly left-to-right direction and slightly shallow elevation, was impossible for a shot coming from the Texas School Book Depository window. Donahue also came across this interview with railroad worker S.M. or Sam Holland, who was standing on top of the triple underpass during the assassination and had a pretty good view of Elm Street. In essence, Holland saw a Secret Service man stand up on the seat of the follow-up car and then fall over, just like he was shot too, at about the same time the president was shot the second time. Holland apparently confused the president's car and the Secret Service follow-up car. Both vehicles were very similar in appearance, the same dark color, both convertibles, same model but with different modifications, and different occupants. It's a mistake we believe other witnesses occasionally made also. No one stood up in the president's car with anything that looked like a machine gun. It happened in the Secret Service follow-up car. And it wasn't a machine gun, of course. It was the AR-15. That Secret Service man falling over, that was a very important clue. We can corroborate Holland's account of a Secret Service man falling like he was shot too with early erroneous reports that a Secret Service man was also killed during the assassination. I was being administered shortly before 1 o'clock. Ron, yes, Bill Lord so. briefly reported from the sheriff's office in Dallas, and he confirms that the sheriff's office say that there were four shots fired, that a Secret Service agent was killed, which indicates the deadly accuracy of these shots. Four uh, shots fired, one uh, agent killed, and both the president and uh, Governor Connolly fell by them. Either they were awfully close or using uh, rifles, it would seem. It has been confirmed that the Secret Service agent yes, was killed. Yes, the sheriff's office in Dallas. I just feel numb by the magnitude of the events. Uh, the rumors that came back was that President Kennedy had been shot, that Governor Connolly had been shot, that a Secret Service agent had been shot, shot. Uh, and then it came back that uh, President Kennedy was dead, that uh, Connolly was seriously wounded, and so on. So. Right. People were mentioning the president was shot and someone else said a Secret Service agent was shot, and there were just stories flying all over. But there is some confusion as to whether a Secret Service man also was killed at the time of the shooting. There has been no official confirmation of any Secret Service man being killed, although there are widespread reports, including one from the Dallas Police Department, that a Secret Service man was killed at the same time President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly were shot. Then Donahue started putting the clues together. Double bang? Well, actually, that wasn't Donahue's clue, but it fits. Odor of gun smoke? Secret Service man falling like he was killed, too? Sound of a shot or shots from somewhere around the car itself? 6.0 millimeter entrance wound in the skull, which was impossible for a 6.5 millimeter Carcano bullet to produce, but was perfectly consistent with a 5.56 millimeter bullet and a trajectory passing right over the follow-up car. Donahue put the pieces of the puzzle together and came to a brilliant and startling conclusion. George Hickey had accidentally shot the president with the AR-15 rifle. Secret Service agent. So now, let me be very clear on this. You're saying that the Secret Service killed President Kennedy. I think that President Kennedy was killed in a, an incredible, tragic accident by one of uh, President Kennedy's bodyguards who, in doing the best he could to protect the president, accidentally discharged his weapon and struck Mr. Kennedy in the head. Right, now the Sound preposterous? 
people who just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, unintended victims, get shot all the time and are often killed. Freak accidents really aren't as freakish as some people think. They can and do happen, and they happen a lot when guns are involved. In fact, the Kennedy assassination wouldn't even be the only time the Secret Service has had a firearms accident. We can corroborate an accident with an account by Parkland nurse Phyllis Hall. Doris Nelson. And uh, she had just come back to the triage to tell us that there had been an accident in the motorcade and they were on the way. Well, they were there by that time. Next came this man in a white shirt with the biggest gun I've ever seen in my life. He's holding it up like this, and I mean, it was huge. The big gun that she saw had to be the AR-15. At the trademark where Kennedy was headed when he was shot, this announcement was made. And what is a mishap but another word for accident? In light of Donahue's theory, this statement made by Senator Ralph Yarborough becomes very interesting indeed. Again, Yarborough was in the next car behind Kennedy's Secret Service follow-up car. Donahue's work was first reported in a two-part article in the Baltimore Sun written by Ralph Reppert. It was a sold-out issue. Donahue's work was later chronicled in the 1992 book Mortal Error, written by Bonner Menninger. Menninger recently added a new piece of information to the body of knowledge. Donahue had assumed that the fall caused Hickey to reflexively squeeze the trigger. However, Menninger learned that the early AR-15 rifles had a critical design flaw. This defect could cause the weapon to fire unintentionally without the trigger even being pulled in an event called a slam fire. An AR-15 slam fire shooting was caused by the interaction between the two heavy firing pin shown at the bottom of this image and the highly sensitive nature of the early 223 ammunition primer. Momentum initiated, say, by the sudden falling of an agent holding the AR-15, could bring the too heavy free-floating firing pin to strike the highly sensitive primer with enough force to cause the primer to spark, ignite the powder in the cartridge case, and discharge the bullet, without the trigger ever being pulled. And although this flaw was later essentially corrected, According to the occasional anecdotal accounts, some form of slam fire might still occur with the AR-15. In 2013, the 50th anniversary year of the assassination, Australian detective Colin McLaren reiterated Donahue's work in a book, audiobook, and Reels Channel documentary called JFK the Smoking Gun. McLaren added a detective's perspective to the case and uncovered a few new pieces of supporting evidence, but basically left Donahue's theory unchanged. If you're going to a crime scene and you're trying to work out what's actually going on, invariably you'll find out through your witnesses. They'll solve it for you. We agree with that statement that the witnesses will solve the case for reasons we'll explain later. And we looked at a few more witnesses than Donahue and McLaren did and gave some statements a somewhat different interpretation than Donahue did. But we wondered, could Donahue have been right? Could Hickey have accidentally shot the president that he loved so well? Let's look at what Hickey said about his activities related to the assassination. The drivers of the above cars, accompanied by agents Sarles and Lawson, then drove to the garage beneath the airport's main terminal building, 
where security was placed on the cars by the Dallas Police Department, as arranged by Special Agent in charge Sorrells. Agents Hickey, Kinney, Lawson, and Sorrells then drove in a Dallas field office car to the Sheraton Hotel in Dallas, where reservations had been made for us. Agent Kinney and I then... Wait a second. What was that? What? Hickey was the one who was supposed to have written this memo. Why would he refer to himself in the third person? Unless... Unless he didn't write his own memo. Unless somebody else wrote it for him based on an agreed-upon story and in the process accidentally forgot to change Hickey to I. Hickey's memo isn't the only Secret Service memo that's dubiously authored. This one was, too. So we take anything that comes from the Secret Service with a grain of salt. But one curious thing in Hickey's memo, as Colin McLaren noted, is that he was apparently ordered to return the AR-15 to the follow-up car as soon as Lyndon Johnson was taken inside the hospital. As McLaren points out, the Secret Service agents at Parkland didn't know at this point whether the assassination was the work of one man or a cabal of multiple assassins working together. But Hickey was quickly ordered to return the most powerful weapon in the Secret Service arsenal to the follow-up car. Why? We think the answer had to do with Hickey's state of mind. Some newspapers reported Senator Yarborough describing an agent in the car immediately ahead, although most accounts say it was an agent in the president's car, which was two cars ahead, banging his fist against the trunk of the car in frustration, anger, and despair. In the president's car, the only agent who could have banged on the trunk was Clint Hill. We think Clint Hill had his hands full climbing into the car and holding on for dear life during the high-speed ride to Parkland Hospital to have done anything more than to give the quick thumbs down he describes in his interviews. I got myself up, I wedged myself above President and Mrs. Kennedy in the back of the car and then hung on for dear life as we were going down Stemmons Freeway. Clint Hill has never described beating his fist against the car in any of the interviews that we've seen and Yarborough's view of the president's car was blocked by the follow-up car. We think the agent who was banging his fist against the car was George Hickey. But even if it was Clint Hill that Yarborough saw, we have other indications of Hickey's state of mind immediately following the assassination. And that state of mind was agitated. In this account, the agent holding the submachine gun looked so agitated that hospital staff were terrified he would open fire and rushed for cover. This agitated agent with the machine gun, or AR-15 as we've noted, delivered an uppercut to an FBI agent without provocation. Or maybe it was more than just an uppercut. More than just a bare-knuckled blow from a fist. Dr. Charles Crenshaw remembered the same event, but remembered it a little differently. I looked to my left and saw a man in a suit running. To my amazement, another man in a suit jumped in his path and smashed a Thompson submachine gun across his chest and face. The first man's eyes immediately turned glassy, and he fell against a gray tile wall and slithered to the floor unconscious. When I heard that gun slam against his face, I just knew the man's jaw was broken. Normally, I would have rushed over and treated the poor guy, but the President of the United States was waiting for me, and his condition was worse than broken bones. I was to learn later that the man with the gun was a Secret Service agent, and the one who had been hit was an FBI agent. Later on, when Dr. Crenshaw arrived home from the hospital, it wasn't just the president's death that was on his mind. The look on the face of the man with the machine gun still bothered me. I didn't want to cross paths with him ever again. 
Here is how Governor John Connolly remembered the same event. But a few minutes before they brought in the body of the president, a Secret Service agent had burst into the emergency room, his face contorted with emotion, waving a submachine gun. Everyone in the room hit the floor. When a man in a business suit ran in, the agent slugged him on the jaw, and as he slumped to the floor, the man pulled out the card that identified him as an agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Again, there was no submachine gun, only the AR-15. Oh, and not a single one of the Secret Service agent reports on the events of that day describes this incident. We also have a description by an airman named William Sale, who was at Love Field, of the driver of the president's limousine returning to Air Force One, appearing white as a ghost and having to be helped back onto the plane. Vince Palomara believes that the driver who was as white as a ghost was William Greer, who drove the car during the assassination. But the agent who drove JFK's limo back to the airport was George Hickey. However, Hickey didn't board Air Force One, but the cargo plane. So who was it, Greer or Hickey? Greer didn't need to be helped back onto the plane. In fact, he helped load the casket onto the plane. And Airman Sale wouldn't have had any reason to remember the driver who left Love Field with the living president. But he certainly had reason to remember the driver who returned to Love Field with the blood-splattered limousine. And that driver was Hickey. And then there's this FBI memo, which places the gun that apparently killed the president in the hands of the Secret Service, specifically Forrest Sorrells, on the same day as the assassination. This couldn't have been the Oswald gun found in the Texas School Book Depository. That gun was found by the Dallas police, who turned it over directly to the FBI without going through the Secret Service. The Oswald gun was never in the hands of the Secret Service. But of course, the AR-15 was. Something else that supports Donahue's theory was that infamous puff of smoke that occurred about the same time as the headshot. Just horrible. There was a series of shots, and I saw this flash of line in the puff of smoke from the knoll uh, in front of us. Where, by the way, the Warren Commission says nothing ever took place. Oh, I saw it. You saw that puff of smoke. Oh, I did. You know something happened. I at know the knoll. someone was shooting from there. Gene Hill wasn't the only one who saw that infamous puff of smoke. S.M. Holland, on top of the triple underpass, also saw it. Here is Holland's FBI report. Here's a bit of his Warren Commission testimony. Here's what Sam Holland told Mark Lane. Did you look in any particular direction when you heard the shots? Yes, I looked over to where I thought the shot came from, and I saw a puff of smoke still lingering underneath the trees in front of the wooden fence. The report sounded like it came from behind the wooden fence. Even though Holland believed the puff of smoke to have originated from behind the fence, he actually saw it in front of the fence. Holland was not alone among the railroad men on top of the triple underpass to see the puff of smoke. R.C. Dodd thought that the smoke came from, quote, behind the hedge, end quote, though not from behind the fence. Well, uh, we all three seen four seen about the same thing as the shots. The smoke came from behind the hedge. James Simmons saw the smoke in front of the fence. And there was a puff of smoke that came underneath the trees on the embankment. 
Where was the puff of smoke, Mr. Simmons, in relation to the wooden fence? It was right directly in front of the wooden fence. Clement Johnson also saw the puff of smoke, but thought it came from a motorcycle. Austin Miller called it a powder dust spray rather than a puff of smoke. He saw it in the street directly to the driver's side and rear of the car. We think Austin Miller was actually describing the follow-up car rather than the president's limousine, confusing the two vehicles which, as we've noted, were similar in appearance. Elsewhere, he says smoke or steam, and he thought it was coming from the trees, which was probably an indication of height. What would be really helpful is a witness on the opposite side of the fence. And we have one. Lee Bowers was on the other side of the fence in the two-story tall railroad tower. Prior to the assassination, Bowers had seen a couple of cars driving around the parking lot and then leaving. Well, maybe they were just looking for a parking place. One of the drivers seemed to be holding something up to his mouth. Bowers thought it was a microphone. But it was lunchtime. Maybe it was a sandwich. This is what Bowers told Mark Lane. Uh, at the time of the shooting, uh, in the vicinity of where the two men I've described were, there was a flash of light, or an, there was something which occurred which caught my eye in this immediate area on the embankment. And what this was, I could not state at that time, and at this time I could not uh, identify it, other than there was some unusual occurrence, a flash of light or smoke or, or something, uh, which uh, caused me to um, feel like something out of the ordinary had occurred there. Here's the view Bowers had during the assassination. In the stitched panorama of the same view, we can see a bit of Elm Street next to the concrete pergola where the steps lead and through the window cutouts of the wall. We think this area is where Lee Bowers saw his flash of light or puff of smoke or whatever drew his attention. Eugene Boone, who was in front of the sheriff's office on Main Street when he heard the shots, raced across the street and towards the knoll in time to see the president's limousine disappear under the triple underpass. He spoke with Lee Bowers shortly thereafter. A couple things, though. When you first got around there, you looked over by the area of the stockade fence where so many theories place a second gunman that day. Did you? Is there anything you can tell us that might lend credence to the possibility of there being a gunman back there? Well, prior to that, I had talked with uh, Mr. Bowser, who was in the railroad control tower. Yeah, Lee Bowers. And I asked him if he had seen anybody running in the area or seen anything that was out of place. Uh, he advised that he didn't see anything and that he had not heard any shots. So then I went back toward the school book depository and searched the area along the grassy area there where the hedge was and the fence area back to where the bridge abutment uh, came together. I didn't see anything to cause me to believe that there was anybody had fired a shot from that area. I believe if somebody had fired from the, from the hedge area, they would have had to be standing in the flower bed in order to do that. The grassy, the, the area there had recently been turned and everything had been beautified, the whole area had been beautified uh, because of that. And there was just a crust that forms over freshly turned dirt and uh, that dirt was not disturbed. And so I surmised from that that nobody was standing in the flower beds doing any shooting from that. So there weren't really anyone else? I didn't see anybody. Speaking. I just saw the porter that I talked to, and then I talked to uh, um, uh, Mr. Bowder in the, uh, in the control tower, and he didn't say that he saw anybody else out there. Had he seen somebody, I probably would have gone to try to uh, find out who that was. Anything more you can tell us about Lee Bowers, the uh, switching tower operator? I had a very short interchange with him. I just asked him if he saw anybody 
in the freight yard. He said he did not. I asked him if he'd heard any shot. He said he had not. You know that Bowers later expanded his he, story. That he, that he heard something and saw something. I, I don't know what that was. But, but right after the assassination, he told you he saw... That's correct. That's okay. correct. There's a bit of discrepancy when Boone says that Bowers told him that he hadn't heard anything. We previously used Lee Bowers as a double bang witness. Mr. Bowers, how many shots did you hear? There were three shots, and these were spaced uh, with one shot, then a pause, and then two shots in very close order, such as perhaps... Uh... This shot sequence is exactly what Bowers told the Warren Commission he had heard. And Bowers signed a sworn Sheriff's Department affidavit on the same day as the assassination, saying that he heard at least three shots very close together. At least three shots is very interesting, and we'll get back to that later. But this discrepancy of Boone saying that Bowers told him he hadn't heard anything we take to be as a minor misunderstanding that occurred during the very brief conversation between the two men, or perhaps a small misunderstanding on Boone's part. For now, the point is that Bowers didn't see anyone on his side of the fence, aside from a couple of drivers in the parking lot sometime before the assassination. There is also a transcript of Mark Lane's original interview with Bowers in which Bowers told Lane that there was no one shooting from his side of the wooden fence. No one was there. But that piece of information, that Bowers didn't see any shooter on his side of the fence, seems to have been edited out of Mark Lane's final film. Maybe Mark Lane didn't think that little piece of information was important, but we do. And it's unfortunate that that portion of Bowers' interview got left out. So why didn't Bowers see the shooter? Because the shooter was in a car, on the road, on the other side of the fence, in a vehicle that immediately left the scene of the shooting. Colin McLaren learned that the early model AR-15s and their military equivalent, the M-16s, had a tendency to produce a puff of smoke when they were fired. It was a flaw that, like the slam fire problem, was later corrected, although, of course, the puff of smoke was potentially less hazardous. Here, an early model AR-15 produces puffs of smoke. Well, those were three-shot bursts. Here's the military version of the weapon, the M16, in single-shot mode. By you can see that sometimes the weapon produced a small puff of smoke, and sometimes it produced a larger puff of smoke, as we see here. So why did Holland and some of the other railroad men believe that the shooter was on the other side of the fence or firing from the hedges? Well, consider that the follow-up car was not stationary. By the time they noticed the puff of smoke, the follow-up car may have traveled some unknown distance out from under it. Also remember that follow-up car driver Sam Kinney had to veer to the right to avoid hitting Clint Hill, which would have put Hickey's position that much closer to the fence side of the road. And note the position of the turnpike sign blocking part of Holland's view of the knoll. Also note how the road curves to the left on the other side of the sign. Sam Holland said that the smoke was six to eight feet above ground level, closer to the height of the under canopy of the tree than one would naturally equate with someone sitting in a car. Hickey reportedly stood at least part way up on the rear seat, placing him higher than a person standing on the ground and placing the muzzle of the AR-15 at a height that bystanders likely equated with the knoll 
rather than the road. Holland also said that the smoke was coming out from under the trees. However, given the wind direction, it seems more likely that the smoke was being blown towards the trees rather than away from the fence. And when Hickey fell, he was immediately out of sight, hidden by the other occupants of the car, so the source of the smoke was not immediately apparent. That visual clue was immediately gone. It was a combination of perspective, of the car being closer to the fence, of the height of the puff of smoke, of Hickey falling out of sight, of seeing no apparent source of the shot, of the direction of the wind blowing the smoke closer to the fence rather than out away from the fence, of the curve of the road, of the follow-up car immediately moving out from under the smoke, of the sign blocking part of the view that caused most of the railroad workers on top of the triple underpass to believe a shot had been fired from behind the wooden fence or from the hedges when it actually was fired from the road in front of the wooden fence, right where Austin Miller saw his powder dust spray on the driver's side rear of the car. Plus, there's another reason. The reaction from the motorcycle escort officers and the subsequent rush up the knoll contributing to the impression that the shot originated from there. We'll get back to the motorcycle officers and the others rushing up the knoll in a later episode. That puff of smoke seen by multiple witnesses adds support to Donahue's theory. We like Donahue's conclusion that Kennedy was struck by an accidental shot from Hickey's AR-15 when Hickey fell over. And as Bonner Menninger learned, Hickey didn't even have to pull the trigger. But Donahue's theory, as he originally presented it, has some problems. It's not a perfect theory. There are parts of it that are wrong. For example, one mistake was Donahue's reliance on Roy Kellerman's Warren Commission testimony for his first shot scenario. Kellerman told the Warren Commission that he had heard the president say, My God, I am hit, after the first shot. Kellerman believed it was the president who said that because of Kennedy's Boston accent, and the president was the only man in the car who had that accent. But the president was not the only person in the car who had that accent. Did it seem to you that the presidential limousine slowed down or stopped at any point? It slowed down almost, if not to a stop. And I saw Jackie, she hollered, Oh, my God, he's been shot. I heard that. Yes. And I heard this noise, and uh, I didn't know what it was, but I turned to look at the president, and his hands flew up to his neck, and he sort of sunk down in the seat. He didn't say a word, but his eyes looked so troubled. And Jackie Kennedy herself testified that her husband made no sound, and that she herself said, Oh my God, they've shot my husband, or words to that effect. This may seem like a trivial difference, a minor point as to who said, My God, I am hit, or My God, he's been shot, but it speaks to Kennedy's condition after the first assassination shot. So while Donahue relied on Roy Kellerman's testimony, we discount it. It was Jackie who said that about her husband, not the president who said that about himself. Once the shooting began, the president didn't say anything. We'll get to the reason why he said nothing in another episode. Donahue was also wrong to accept the cowlick entry presented to him by Dr. Russell Fisher. There are reasons to support the EOP entry rather than the cowlick, reasons that go beyond the original EOP entrance described in the autopsy report and later autopsy doctors' disavowal of the cowlick entrance. We'll talk more about that another time. 
but we like the original EOP entrance for the AR-15 shot. However, that EOP entry presents a whole new set of problems for us to resolve in our next episode, because the EOP entry would mean that Donahue made a mistake in his trajectory. And if his trajectory is wrong, as some critics point out, his whole theory falls apart. But does it? Wouldn't it be a logical fallacy to reject the whole theory if only a part of it was wrong? We think Donahue was wrong about his first shot ricochet theory, wrong about his acceptance of the single bullet theory, wrong about his acceptance of the cowlick entry, and wrong about a few other details, but he was absolutely correct about the AR-15 accident. The AR-15 accident, however, is only half the story. We have a lot of respect for Howard Donahue and his remarkable theory, even if he made some mistakes. Donahue's mistakes were not due to errors in his thinking processes, but because he relied on evidence that had been fabricated. This same fabricated evidence has been used by many other researchers to support one erroneous theory or another, because for many years it was considered the consummate proof of what happened, the unquestioned pinnacle of assassination evidence, unparalleled in quality, the standard against which any theory of the assassination was judged. The purported time clock of the assassination, the Zapruder film. Learn why the extant Zapruder film should not be trusted as evidence of anything in part four, the time clock.